Hey everybody, we're Chelsea and Tony Northrup and you're listening to or watching our podcast, Picture This. Grab it on your podcasting app, whatever it is that you use. Yeah, and you've got to stream it. You can't just download it. <laughs> trust me, just trust me. I don't care, you can download it. No, I can't. <sighs> Today, we're going to be talking about six wildlife tips you need to know. That's not clickbait, guys. That's for <laughs> real. You need to know this shit, and you need to know it right now. <laughs> wow. I'm passionate. So, our number six tip. These aren't... Oh, first, I got to tell them. Of course, you got to tell them. The I got to tell you. You know who makes this possible? Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, you can make your first move, your best move, your smartest move with Squarespace. They have beautiful award-winning templates, all-in-one platform, and amazing 24-7 customer support. Tony and I have Squarespace portfolios, and we really like it. You want to try one out for 14 days, no credit card needed? Go to squarespace.com slash Tony and use the coupon code portfolio to get 10% off of your entire purchase. Thanks, Squarespace. You know what I'm going to do for the mid-rolls? I'm actually going to add a new picture, a new wildlife picture to my portfolio. You're crazy. I'll show that it can be done in a matter of seconds. Whoa, stay tuned. And it'll look great. That sounds bonkers. <laughs> Thanks for sponsoring us, Squarespace. These aren't really in any strict order except the number one i think is the the most important and number six i think people think is the most important mm -hmm. but not necessarily and that's gear yeah gear people wildly overestimate the the importance of it and i say that with two massive 600 millimeter f4 lenses on my desk uh, but the single most well getting closer is way more important than gear uh, for one, if you are a technical person, you can understand that atmosphere doesn't convey light perfectly. On If there's any level of humidity, any amount of haze, the farther you are from something, the less clear it's going to be. So even if you have a 600 millimeter lens, you're always striving to get closer and closer and closer. And in fact, we've tested a lot of different wildlife lenses, like say the Tamron 150 to 600, especially the original, wasn't that great at the long end. And yet, so many people out there get amazing photos with it. Why do you think that is? Because they get close and there are other elements in wildlife photography that are more important than having the sharpest lens. Exactly. Yeah, if you can wasn't... fill the frame with any lens, even if it's mediocre, you're going to get a fantastic picture that people are going to love. We get a lot of questions from people that love wildlife photography and they're saying, which gear should I get? I wish I could get that $10,000 long lens or I don't have the money for, for that. What should I do? Do you think that having the biggest lens is the most important thing? Oh, definitely not. You you have to put in so much time before you can even use the big gear. It's a real challenge to use something like a 600 millimeter F4. And in fact, any anybody new to wildlife photography they'd get better pictures with a 75 to 300 zoom that they could actually handle than one of these big lenses it takes years really before you're kind of ready to get those results so growing into your gear can be more advantageous than just getting your dream rig and suddenly having this huge lens and a perfect camera there are advantages to growing into that setup so what do you think the advantages of starting with a, a smaller lens are You'll, you'll learn to find the subjects in the frame a lot easier because with a telephoto lens, you're looking through just a tiny little pinhole mm. of the world. And especially if a bird is flying. I've seen so many people when I hand them a wildlife camera for the first time, they cannot find the subject. Even at 400 millimeters, even 200 millimeters can be difficult if it's like a bird on a branch or something. You know, they camouflage. They make themselves difficult to see. It takes so much practice to pop the lens up and find something in that split second that you have before the bird takes off. So practicing that technique is a good idea and it's nice to start small and then grow into your gear and kind of develop your skills alongside these new bigger lenses. Yeah, so that's why I want to start about with talking about the gear. Yes, all the best wildlife photographers probably have expensive gear, but that's because they're putting the time in and they're doing everything else right. So the gear helps them get the most out of every moment that they spend in the field. But people starting out, don't let not having expensive gear hold you back because all the other things we're going to cover are really more important than the gear. And that brings me to number five, 
which is the location. Tell us about that. Oh, location is so important for multiple reasons. First of all, you need to get where there are animals, right? Um, and the other thing is you want to be someplace where animals are okay with you being there when you're a beginner. So I know a lot of beginners think, oh, I need to go out to Africa and go on safari or I need to go to some exotic place and get the most exotic animals in the most remote locations. But that's not necessarily true for you at first. You can just start by having a location close to you where you know you'll have access to animals and where they'll be okay with you being there. And a good example of that is a local park of some sort. The animals there are used to people, so they're not going to run away as soon as you come out to look at them uh, and they will be there reliably. So even though you're not getting the most exciting animal, you might not be getting a diving eagle necessarily, but you can practice your technique by getting continually getting shots of, let's say, even a seagull, a gull. I know it's not exciting, but that's a great way to practice getting a bird in the shot. What about all the people who say there's no animals around me? Well, I think that there are two parts to that. I think that people, first of all, don't keep their eyes open. Um, we have a nesting pair of eagles right near our home on the Niantic River. And most people I talk to don't even know that because they don't look for an eagle. They don't know how to look for an eagle. Um, so you have to be aware of your surroundings. There are osprey almost covering the entire country, North America. Yeah, even the world. Um, yeah, they're all over the world. You have to know where to look for them. Um, and you have to be open to researching which animals are near you. And you can go on local forums, uh, the Autobahn Society. People will have forums and they'll share where they see different animals. So do a little bit of research before you just write off where you are. And then the other thing is, like I said, be content with not getting the, the greatest, most exciting animals at first. Practice your technique on what you have. It's okay if you have songbirds or gulls, as I was mentioning. Sparrows are everywhere. That's a great way to practice. Just get the best seagull or sparrow possible yeah. picture you possibly could. Um, we have a reader's group for our book and someone posted the most beautiful gull picture. They got like tons of likes. Everyone loved it. It was such a beautiful picture. <laughs> Number four, light is something nobody really appreciates. I think we have so many technically minded people, but light falls more in the category of art. But good light versus bad light. Good light will create an amazing and sharp looking picture and bad light will create a muddy and very boring picture. I think when you're first starting out, you should the, the key is spending as much time as possible out in the field, tracking animals, learning their behavior, taking photographs. But then as you get better and better, you start to, well, I'll wake up every morning and I'll look out the window. And if I see clear skies, then I'm grabbing a camera and I'm going out first thing. If I check the forecast and it's overcast all day, then I'll feel like, oh, you know, I'm not going to get a great picture today. I'll do desk work today. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow when there's clear skies, I'll get out and take pictures. So I do kind of schedule my shoots around when I know there's going to be good light. I'll also say I pick my spot where I'm going to shoot based on the light. You Almost always with wildlife shots, you're better off having the sun to your back. So... The sun is behind you and the animals are in front of you because while front lighting and hard front lighting doesn't necessarily make a great portrait for wildlife, it makes the shot much sh sharper and it also makes all the colors pop. The difference in the amount of color and saturation and clarity and everything is so much better when you have that hard light on your subject. That's not to say you can't get great backlit shots. Some of my favorite shots were backlit, but generally the light is something you really need to think about. And, and do you think that depends on the animal as well? Um, you know, I I think you'll get different effects with different light. Like birds, like bald eagles have this tail that kind of fins out. And if it gets backlit, it'll kind of glow. And that's a nice effect. Um, colorful animals like uh, a red finch would definitely benefit from having that front lighting because it'll make the color pop more. And furry animals, you know, backlighting can look nice because it'll make a little halo. Anyway. Regardless of whether you choose front lighting or back lighting, make it a conscious choice. And if you said, hey, there's a 100% chance you'll get a nice close-up picture of this animal, but the light is muddy and boring. Or there's a 10% chance that you'll get 
a beautifully lit picture of this animal, but it's probably not going to happen. For me, where I am now, I would pick the spot with the good light and just hope the animal happens to show up there because I don't really need any more pictures of animals in muddy light. Yeah, me either. Let's take a minute and talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. You told us you were going to add a picture to your portfolio. Okay, let's do it. I'll show you just how easy it is. So I'm at my portfolio, northropphotography.com. I'll just hit the escape key. It prompts me to log in. And now that I'm logged in, I'll go over to the pages here, my portfolio link, and you can see it shows me all these little thumbnails. All I gotta do to put a new picture in is I'll click this, scroll over to the folder. my picture and then it uploads it uploads you can also just drag and drop now I have to make a choice Chelsea because I like to put all my best pictures at the top but do you think that eagle picture is better than the osprey picture or is the osprey better than the eagle picture Ooh. I think you should try the eagle first freshen it up okay and I don't like to put too many pictures in a row of the same sort of subjects so I'll I'll push my osprey picture down a little bit. And in fact, you know what? Maybe I'll move this eagle picture right up here. So now I'm ready to preview it. I can see a live preview. None of this has to go live. I can have a little beta site set up so I can test everything. So there, I made it my second page. What do you think? Looks pretty good? Look at the fish's face. That's great. That's all you have to do to get your portfolio running on Squarespace. It's drag and drop. You don't have to know about HTML or CSS or any of that. You can drop a picture in like that. And that lets me keep my portfolio updated all the time. I used to run with an old type of website and it would be such a pain that I would just never update it. Yeah. But now my portfolio is always fresh. It looks so much better. And I benefit from having these really intelligent Squarespace designers who know how to make beautiful, modern looking website. So thank you, Squarespace. If you want your own awesome Squarespace portfolio, go to squarespace.com slash Tony, get a 14 day free trial, and get it all set up, see how awesome you look. And then if you like it, only then do you have to give them a credit card, use the coupon code portfolio and you'll get 10% off. Number three is animal behavior. Tell me about that. Yes, we are counting down six tips that we feel you have to know if you wanna be better at wildlife photography. And we're on number three, and that's animal behavior. One thing I've learned from shooting wildlife is that a lot of great wildlife photographers are biologists. They started by studying animals in the first place. They know where they live, when they're awake, when they look for food, when they mate. They know all of the behavior to find, a, to get a great picture. Mm -hmm. All they need to learn next is photography. If you're starting as a photographer, you have gotta work backwards now you have to learn about animals, and that's how you're going to get the best wildlife picture possible. Here's an example. I wanted, I heard that there were owlets at a location that I was frequenting, uh, little great horned owls, and I didn't know how to find them, but I had learned that crows will tell you where they are. They fight a lot. The crows bother the owls, and they harass them. So I went out to the location that I knew that there were kind of around and I listened for the crows and I would hear them really act up. So I started following the crows and sure enough, they led me right to the mother great horned owl and to the owlets. And so if I hadn't known that, I would have had to go, it was just like a couple acres that I was kind of walking around, but I would have had to try to find them in almost every tree and kind of guess which trees they might be in based on where they build their nests. Um, but knowing that bit of animal behavior helped me get a great shot of the owlets. You know what my little favorite animal behavior is? What? Birds will almost always take off into the wind. So if you want to, if you know that maybe an eagle is going to pull a fish out of the water and you want to get their face and not their butt, yeah. pay attention to the wind and go stand on that side. Yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of people are against zoo photos. Um, if you're just kind of making categories of animals for yourself, I think zoo photos are fine. But 
I think the one really big drawback to zoo photos is that you're not seeing the animals in their natural habitat, so you're not learning their behavior. There's really no chance that you're going to get a very interesting picture. Um, so going out into the wild and seeing them in their natural habitat and seeing how they behave is really important. That's a big part of it. The other part of that is that nobody wants to see an animal just standing still. I mean, you can have a pretty beautiful picture, but that's not very compelling. If you get a picture of animals playing or feeding, if you're one of those lucky people that gets a picture of an animal giving birth or some rare event, you've just brought your picture up to the next level. That's some National Geographic stuff. I just saw that um, a biologist got a picture of, I think, a baboon giving birth. Mm. He made the news, of course. That's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing to view that. So. And I noticed you said a biologist got the picture and not a photographer well, got Well, he picture. was a biologist first. Right. And when I read National Geographic and I look at the amazing pictures and then I read the bio of the photographer, they always have like a PhD in very specialized biology. So, yeah, you're right. Biologist first, photographer second. Number two, we're getting close to the number one, which ties oh, so much everything. tension. I know. Ties it all together. Number Atmosphere, two. mood, and story. Yeah. I think this is what separates a technically good picture from a compelling picture, something that moves you. And I, I first really noticed this because I've been shooting songbirds for many years, and I would shoot them sort of near a feeder in my backyard, and I was getting very close, detailed pictures, but they were kind of uninteresting. And then one day, this huge snowstorm came, and I didn't want to be standing out in the snow, so I was shooting through the glass, which means I'm getting less sharp pictures. And the atmosphere was crazy, so there wasn't a lot of detail or clarity. But then uh, my picture of a blue jay in the snow got uh, it was like one of my most liked pictures ever. And why was that? It was because there was atmosphere, there was mood, there was story. It was covered in snow, and little snowflakes were collecting on it. And it just it wasn't the technically the best picture. But these are the things that will take your your pictures to the next level. We kind of discussed some key parts of storytelling already. Things like a uh, bird eating seed or owl feeding, feeding its babies. That's story, right? right? And that's so much more compelling than just a bird. Your pictures should tell a story about the animal, at least once you get advanced enough. So saying, hey, this is an osprey, is that's a picture. But a story is, here's an osprey bringing a fish to its young. And that's a story. Yeah. It will move people. Yeah, that's absolutely an important part of it. Um, I think the other thing is when you're really focusing on the technical parts of wildlife photography, which are extremely challenging, it's easy to get lost in that. And I see that like people just chasing the sharpness and their photos don't really change much. Even if they're doing it for years, they have these technically perfect close-ups of a bird head. And it's like, great. Like you said, that's a bird head. Um, when you get a backlit, emotional, dramatic picture of a bird diving for fish and hitting the water, you're creating drama and tension. And that's that's kind of what you want to do in photography anyway, right? Just because there's an animal in the picture doesn't mean you should take away all of those other exciting parts of photography. So be sure to combine the basics of photography, having the atmosphere, mood, and story with your technical skills you'll need to learn taking wildlife pictures. The number one most important thing when you're a wildlife photographer is patience and persistence, right? Right, absolutely. You so can, what do you mean by that? You can have the most expensive gear. Um, and if you're not getting out every single day or every time that you can, um, rain, snow, sunshine, whenever it is to practice, you're not gonna get the best shots. You can't just expect a good picture to happen. It's not like you can make a set, like when you're, when you're doing fashion photography. You have to wait. So make yourself comfortable when you go out there and realize it's about the process, not just about getting the picture. Because some days you go out and you're hoping to see some particular behavior and it just doesn't happen. You can't make the animals do that uh, unless you're shady and you're baiting them or something. Well, you said make yourself comfortable. What do you mean by that? How can you do that? I've seen people bring like, uh, pads to sit on or little stools or chairs. Um, if, you're, if it's cold, bring yourself a hot coffee and a thermos, put on bug spray, put on comfortable clothes, uh, be prepared to just hang out and enjoy being out in nature. That's a huge part of it. Um, well, how much patience do you need? Are, are you talking like uh, five minutes 
Well, see, this is the <laughs> thing. I think changing I think changing your whole mindset when you're doing wildlife photography is important because you can't go out there and say, I've got 20 minutes and I want a portfolio shot. It's not like that. You're going to go out there and you're going to say, this is an experience I want to be a part of. Maybe I don't get the shot today, uh, but I'm going to be practicing my technique and I'm going to get one step closer. And it's incremental and it's going to take you years. So... You might get one portfolio shot in a year, but you have to be okay with the fact that it's it's a good time to go out there and just practice and see the animals and be in nature. So yeah, hunker down because you'll be putting in hours and hours and hours <laughs> and years. For me personally, I've been doing it for 20 years now and I still feel like I'm just at the beginning. I'm still learning yeah. stuff just yeah. about every time I go out and I hope I have another 20 years that I can keep doing it. Yeah, and I think I think that the patience and persistence is just a good thing to have for any type of photography. I mean, if your goal is to be the best today, if you really think that there's some quick fix or some little trick or some life hack you can learn, I mean, we've got tips here that can help, but this is the number one one. You've got to put in the time and you've got to enjoy the process and just understand you're going to grow slowly but surely. And who makes all this possible, Chelsea? Of course, again, Squarespace. Thank you, Squarespace, for making this podcast possible. If you'd like to try your own Squarespace portfolio, put your photos in there, your wildlife photos, and then aim towards getting a new portfolio shot at least once a year. Go to squarespace.com slash Tony and use the coupon code portfolio to get 10% off. In the meantime, you can get a 14-day free trial, no credit card needed. It's simple. And also check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography, which has over 14 hours of video. And chapter eight is dedicated to wildlife photography with lots more information in it. It can definitely help you out. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.